So I want to talk to you today about evolutionary architecture, a little bit about the underlying principles as well as some techniques for actually making it work. But first, I want to give a brief introduction into why you should care about it, and then definitions of, are of course important, talk about some of the principles, talk about some of the techniques that we use to actually realize an evolutionary architecture, and then finally, how do you achieve one in practice, in particular if you're dealing with a legacy system? Because most of us do not have the privilege of working in a greenfield environment. So let's start with why you should care. And the first reason, the expectations for the pace of change are not what they used to be. You can't really go in and say, I have an 18-month business case, let alone a five-year business case like we used to talk about. People are looking for things I don't want to hear about it unless you can deliver it into production and show business value in three months. With those kinds of expectations, you have to be able to change your systems more rapidly. Business model lifetimes are shortening. The turnover on the top companies in different industries is changing radically because people are having to rethink their business models. We had one insurance client that their defining asset was their underwriting model. And they were dominating their market until somebody came up with this clever idea called online quotes. Their model had 87 parameters. How many of you would fill in a form with 87 parameters just to get a quote for insurance? All of a the sudden, they realized that what was their primary asset was now the boat anchor that could actually bankrupt them if they didn't fix it. And it's much harder to predict the future. We used to actually talk about 10-year technology roadmaps. It's a little over 10 years that the iPhone was introduced. A 10-year technology roadmap is meaningless. I actually got asked by a reporter about a month ago, what's the tech landscape going to look like in 10 years? And I just laughed at him. I said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I have no clue. My crystal ball stopped working a long time ago. And if you miss your minute of fame, if something that you're doing goes viral and you can't actually exploit it, or you have the ability to ride on someone else's great idea and you don't have the opportunity to exploit it, that entire wave may go away before you've even been able to deploy into production. So we have to care about being able to change our systems radically, and that's what evolutionary architecture is about. People used to say architecture is the stuff that's hard to change, and that's the premise that we're challenging with evolutionary architecture, is architecture cannot be hard to change. We have to make it as easy as possible, I did not say easy, I said as easy as possible to change. So here's our definition of evolutionary architecture. Evolutionary architecture su supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. And there are four phrases in this definition that I want to highlight. And the first one is evolutionary. I don't know how similar these words are in Portuguese, but in English, when people say the word adaptable, what they usually mean is, I've kind of figured out the changes I want to make, so I'm going to add a configuration parameter, or I'm going to have a plug-in architecture or I'm going to have some kind of throttle or some way that I can change in this particular way because I know it's going to change that way. That's what people who speak in native English hear when they hear adaptable. Evolutionary implies to them that you can't actually predict where the change is going to come from. So rather than trying to use your crystal ball or whatever device you use to try to predict the future, you try to put yourself in a position where you can respond to whatever change it is. And that's why we're calling it evolutionary. Guided is the next important term. Neil Ford and I 
have both been talking about this topic for several years. And the first time I heard Neil speak on it, we had a very spirited discussion about the fact he was calling it emergent architecture. Again, I don't know how these things translate in Portuguese, but emergent in the English language implies something that just kind of happens, and there's no real objective to it. Whereas in evolutionary architecture, and we're drawing a lot from the field of evolutionary computation, you have a fitness function. You have something that characterizes for your architecture what constitutes good. Because for clean code, you and I probably agree on the definition of clean code, or at least we usually agree on the def definition of bad code. But architectures are not all the same. I worked on a trading system once. And when we hear trading system, we think high throughput, low latency, got to keep up with the market. The money is to be made in the milliseconds and the nanoseconds. This trading system, in the company's wildest imagination, would do 200 trades a day. Not an hour, not a minute, a day. But each one of those trades was worth billions of dollars. They didn't care about a little bit of latency. They cared about knowing exactly where every trade was, that it was properly replicated across all of their data centers, so regardless of when it was, they could process it. So the architecture of that trading system and what was necessary and important for that trading system to be successful was completely different than most traditional trading systems. There is not one definition of a good architecture. The security that you need to secure health, personal information, is very different than the security you need to protect um, newspaper articles that are in the public domain. There is no such thing as the right security data protection. There is no such thing as the right architecture. So for an individual application and organization and domain, what constitutes a good architecture is different, and that's why we call this guided. Because one of the early steps that you need to take in working in these systems is to decide what are the major architectural characteristics that are most important in your application. Maybe it's mean time to recovery. Maybe it is security. Maybe it is performance. Whatever it is, you want to identify what those characteristics are, and then you want to define a fitness function for it. You want to say, this is what I need. And the important thing about a fitness function is you and I will never disagree on whether it passes or not. We can't just say, the system needs to be flexible or maintainable, because we can argue about what that means. We can't argue about it supports 1,000 transactions per second or 1 million simultaneous users or has a cyclomatic complexity less than 10. Those things are objective. We want to get architectural requirements, these non-functional or cross-functional requirements, to the same level of objective standard that we require our business users to do when we tell them they need to give us an acceptance test. So we can agree on whether or not we've actually delivered the functionality. That's what we mean by guided. We specify a fitness function that tells us this is the objective that our architecture is moving towards. This is what constitutes good. This is how we assess the quality of our architecture. Next, incremental change. What we're looking at in incremental change is how can we support changing even these architectural characteristics in the smallest possible chunk. Some of them you can't. If you've got a big database and you've got to migrate the database, you can't very easily do that piecemeal. We want to be able to deploy these things as independently as possible and ensure that we can make changes in as small an increment as possible. 
And the final is across multiple dimensions. We're not just talking about performance. We're not just talking about security. We're talking about all the illities. And in fact, what we want to introduce is evolvability as one of those architectural characteristics. We want to be able to have the objective that this system is easy to change. And we want to, as we think about what our architecture should look like, think about what are the things that are most important, what are the things that I can kind of ignore, that I don't need to spend a lot of time on because they are not going to have that much influence on the overall design and architecture and implementation of my system. So that's the definition of evolutionary architecture. Now, what are some of the principles? Each of these has a lot of subtlety to it, so I'm going to step through each one of these individually. Last responsible moment is about when we make decisions, when we make our architectural decisions. We want to both think about architecture, but is also the software development process itself in terms of evolvability. We want to think about how the communication works across multiple components in the system. I'm from ThoughtWorks, so I have to talk about testing, but actually we found that testing and thinking about testing is important for getting a good architecture. And then we've got to talk about people and organization, because unfortunately we can't forget that software development is actually a human social activity. So, start with the last responsible moment. We want to delay our decisions for as long as possible, but no longer. And you know, we, we, we use the, that fitness function to tell us which are the decisions that are important, which are the ones that are going to have a significant impact on how we design our system, and that's going to help us define what is that last responsible moment. Because the longer you delay a decision, the more information you have. You know more about what feature set you might need, or what performance characteristics you might need, or you've perhaps been able to uncover where the messy parts of your domain are. And so you can look at it from the perspective of what is going to make the hardest part of my system the easiest to do. So it maximizes the information you have, and it minimizes this in source of inadvertent technical debt. If you've chosen the wrong tool for something, whether it just ha have more features than you need or be more difficult to work with than you need, or is just not right, it isn't giving the features that you want, Every single piece of development you do that touches that tool is a form of technical debt. It's slowing down your development process. It's charging you that interest, just like other forms of technical debt do. And so, as, as I was saying before, you want to decide early what the drivers of your architecture are going to be. In the case of that trading system, we looked hard at our choices around the communications infrastructure and how we were going to do monitoring of messages and how we were going to do replication across multiple data centers because those were the things that were most critical to our success. Whatever that is in your system, you decide that early and it allows you to prioritize your decisions. It allows you to prioritize what things that you're going to actually fight for. And so we're looking at this so that we're not just responding to whatever our environment happens to be, but we're also not trying to guess. One of the big messages of evolutionary architecture is we cannot continue to rely on guesswork. We can't keep predicting the future because we are going to get it wrong. So the next one, architect for evolvability. You want to think about how you're system might evolve, not how it will evolve, not where change will come from, but what's it most likely to look like. And one of the easiest things to do is to think about how you break up functionality. What are the units of functionality within your system? I actually think part of how we got into so much trouble with the first incarnation of service-oriented architectures was that they were being driven by systems, not by concepts. How is it 
the, the working, the, the business processes within your organization, what are the things that float around? What are the terms that they use to talk about behaviors and objects within your organization? If you organize your systems using the same kind of breakdown of functionality that the business operates in, you're more likely to be in a position to reconfigure all of those things when they want to change their business process. So think carefully about how you break down functionality. Do not, do not forget data ownership. One project I worked on, it was in a Fortune 10 global company. We had to go to the global chief financial officer of this organization to get sign off on our data migration. The first thing he did was look at the CIO and say, you have got to fix this problem. The second thing is he assigned his uh, as executive assistant to find somebody to do it for us. But we had to go to the global CFO to have someone who had ownership over all of the data that was in this one system. And it wasn't even what you would consider one of their major systems. So think about who should really be responsible for data and, and partition it accordingly. And appropriate coupling. Not everything needs to be loose coupling. In the A over B style of the Agile Manifesto, you might want to prefer loose, company, loose coupling to tight coupling. But for a given situation, there is going to be an appropriate level of coupling, and you want to think about what that is. And finally, the lightest weight tools and documentation that you can get away with. Because that is going to allow you to move things around as much as possible. Now, what does develop for evolvability mean? Well, a lot of what we're talking about in being able to change a system is how easy or difficult it is for you to understand what that system does. So one of the important parts of evolutionary architecture is actually to think about software quality. Look at the internal quality of your application, focusing on readability and understandability because that's what makes things easier to change. If you're working with an old system, you want to be able to focus on the hotspots. I would love to be able to tell you that no dirty code should ever exist anywhere on the planet, but I'm far too practical for that. But there are going to be places that you are going to want to have, you're, you are going to want to put in the effort to clean up the mess that's already there. But you don't just want to clean it up and then forget about it. You want to continually monitor the quality of your system so that you can take action if things start to go wrong again. One of the things I'm often asked when I'm brought in to justify to CIOs why the development teams should be able to take a six-week pause to clean up technical debt, the most common question I get is, if I let you do this, how do I know you're not going to be back here in nine months' time asking for another six weeks? And this is how I can answer that. Because we've got the quality metrics in place. They are being monitored. And as soon as something starts to go wrong, we'll know it. And the team is committed to keeping it of good quality. So f keep monitoring it continually and focusing on trends. And every once in a while, you want to think about reversibility. The Yagni, you ain't going to need it principle from Agile still applies. You don't want to make every architectural decision completely reversible. You're going to build so much scaffolding and so many abstraction layers that it's going to be a waste. But there are quite often are those decisions where you know you have to choose a path but you really don't feel like you know it's the right decision, or even worse, you don't have consensus within the team about the, what, what the right decision actually is. I have a colleague 
who was in exactly this situation. He was convinced choice A was right. His team was convinced choice B was right. And so they made that decision reversible. They went with choice A. My colleague turned out to be wrong. But it was very easy then to change directions because they had intentionally made it reversible. So think about when that might be appropriate. It's not going to be a lot, but you, you definitely want to keep this in your arsenal. OK, what about Postel's law? Summarized, be as conservative as you can in what you send. As soon as something gets outside your system in a database, in a message, in whatever form, somebody can use it. And as soon as somebody starts using it, particularly if you don't know that they're using it, you are now coupled to that person. And you are exposed to potentially breaking something downstream from you and not necessarily even knowing it. I'm not quite sure why we have a message up there in the corner of the screen. <laughs> but we'll continue. Be liberal in what you receive. Be as forgiving as possible. If all you need to know is a postcode to do some kind of geolocation, don't validate the address. Do what you need to do to make sure you're not exposed to buffer overflow and all of the other security stuff, but don't validate the address. Because if whoever is sending that thing decides they want to change the address format, you should not have to change your application. But if you're validating that address, you do. So be as forgiving as possible with what you receive. Only validate what you need. And this really holds for any kind of information exchange between two parts of a system. How many times are you asked, I know you've given me this API, but can't I just hit the database directly? Continue to say no. <laughs> Integration through a database is still not a very good idea. And then think about using version changes when you do have to break a contract. There is nothing in any of the techniques that we're talking about that will mean that you're never going to break somebody. We just want to know when it happens. And we want it to only happen when it has to, not incidentally. Architect for testability. One of the things that we have actually found is if you think about how hard something is to test, and you focus on making things as testable as possible, you actually end up with quite a clean and flexible architecture. And it's not too surprising, because what you're doing when you define a test is you're, you are describing what is in this particular component. And if that name has to be, it does this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, you probably don't understand what's going on in that unit of computation. It also helps you identify tools that might lead you down a path, perhaps putting business logic in a messaging layer. Those things are still very difficult to test. And that also, you end up with some rather strange behaviors when you try to move things around if too much business logic is in that messaging layer. And again, we want to focus on how can we break up our functionality in a way that makes sense to the business. We had a client, he was the CEO of a medium-sized business, not a Fortune 100, but you know, not a five-person shop either. And every month, he read all of the new acceptance tests for their product. And he told me the reason he, that he did it is because then he knew what his product actually did, as opposed to what the marketing people were trying to tell their customers what the product did. But he could also understand it because all of that discussion, all of those tests were written in his language. They were not written in the language of technology. They were written in the language of his, of his application domain. So think about these things from the concept, from the perspective of the domain, not the systems. And then you want to do testing at lots of different levels, inc including contract testing, including integration testing. And I'll talk more about that in the techniques. And to, to support the volume, 
you're going to need to have build pipelines. When I first started talking about evolutionary architecture, many people said that I was professionally irresponsible for advocating that you should be able to change architecture. Now they realize it's necessary, but I will say that if you do not have the disciplines and some of the build pipelines and the automation that you get with continuous delivery, you shouldn't be doing evolutionary architecture. Start down the path of continuous delivery first because you're not really going to be able to pull this off without the level of automation, the level of build and deployment pipelines that you will get with continuous delivery. And then Conway's Law. You cannot have a group of architects get together and start talking and not have Conway's Law come, if, uh, come up somewhere in the first 15 minutes. Conway's Law basically talks about the relationship between communication patterns of people and systems. And regardless of what you want, any computer system that is built by an organization is going to reflect the communi communication patterns and the communication dysfunctions of the organization. I actually look quite brilliant when I walk into a client and I just watch the various tech leads at lunch and how they behave when they meet each other in the hall. And if they're always stalking around like this and not talking to each other, I know that integration is broken. If the people don't talk, the systems integration is almost guaranteed to be broken. So you need to think about what your organizational structure looks like if you're going to change your system. You can't change your system in a way that violates the established communication mechanism within your organization. You have to change the organization. Silos are a big part of this. How many times have we all heard, well, my stuff works? Well, my stuff works. Well, somebody has a problem if the things don't work together. And so we have to break down those silos. So if you don't want your product to look like your organization, you have to change your organization. We actually call it the inverse Conway maneuver or the reverse Conway maneuver. Fix your systems by fixing your organization. Okay. So what about some techniques? Several of these techniques you could do a day-long, if not a week-long workshop. So you're going to get an overview. But these all address different aspects of how you might work on your system to make it more evolutionary. And the first one I want to start with is database refactoring. And I've been involved in trying to convince organizations about the value of agile software development for a long time. And I've listened to the business analysts say, well, that's all right for developers, but I need to write out the whole story. Or testers, you can't ask me to test something until the system is completely done. Or the experienced designers, well, I need to have my overall flows, everything mapped out, pixel perfect. But the developers, you know, they can use this agile stuff. Architects. The role that I think has actually the best case for saying, no, I can't do this, are the, DD, the DBAs, the database administrators. Because as soon as a database is in production, you can't change it without doing a data migration. And data migration is very easy to describe. I have data in this format, and I'm going to copy it to this format. What could go wrong? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it always goes wrong. There is a book called Refactoring Databases with the subtitle of Evolutionary Database Design that helps you address this problem. Personally, I think it's one of the most important, least appreciated books that's come out in this century. We keep telling uh, Promote, who's a colleague of ours, that they should re-release the book, but swap the title and subtitle, because everybody's talking evolutionary now. Evolutionary database design, great. Got to go out and buy the book. The essential idea, though, 
is to apply to database changes what we talk about all the time when we use the term refactoring for code properly. Refactoring does not mean, boy, I got that wrong. I need to go rewrite the whole system. Refactoring means make small changes, behavior-preserving changes to your code. And incrementally, you can alter your design. This database refactoring is, a, is the same idea. Promote and Scott Ambler in the book break down for relational databases all of the different kinds of changes that you make into these atomic database refactorings. You break any large change into these, this series. And then each change in that series, you, it comes along with how are you changing the database, how do you potentially have to change the code to access the database, and most importantly, how do you do the migration? And then you compose these things in the same way that we compose functions. And now, what you get, of course you version control your changes, what you get now is the ability to find that field that between April 14th of 1984 and February 27th of 1986, meant this, which is why your database migrations break. Data ages very, very badly. And we did some really bad things over the course of several decades, and that's why data migrations fail. Data migrations d don't fail because of the normal case. They fail because we've got all of these little landmines scattered all throughout the data. And we've got to find those. And just like with continuous integration, when we say it's easier to find a bug if you've only changed a little bit of code, it's easier to find that, that odd data, that anomalous data, if you're just doing one small part of the database change. Instead of you running the whole data migration and finding your you know, 55,000 records that have failed, and going through each one and trying to figure out why, you run the individual components of that migration and find the 300 that fail because of this and the 1,500 that fail because of that. And you can make those fixes incrementally. You can identify them much more easily, which allows you to change a database in production. And then you can promote these changes from environment to environment testing that migration along the way as well. Continuous delivery. I mentioned this before. The kinds of changes we are introducing into systems when you take on evolutionary architecture do require a level of rigor in deployments and in operations that many organizations don't have yet. We want to know what our environments actually look like. The snowflake environments where some system admin has lovingly tuned this system in just this particular way and the one sitting next to it is tuned just a little bit different. And then you never really know what the system in production looks like. And so when things go wrong, how do you troubleshoot? You want to automate your builds and your deployments so that you know exactly what's running in production, and you know it's configured properly. I don't care how good the run book is, no human being is good at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and they're going to make mistakes. Automate the testing as at many levels as possible because that means you can continually test it. You don't have to manually check things. Any kind of check that you want to do manually, figure out how to do it in an automated fashion. Because fundamentally, deployments should be boring. You want to celebrate the release of new features to your customers. You don't want to have to celebrate the fact that this time, the CFO didn't come and yell and scream at you because you crashed the systems and you didn't get them back up on time. That doesn't have to happen. Deployments should be boring. I've never gone through a deployment that didn't feel really exciting until we actually realized it was up and running. 
free continuous delivery. And I still have to say this. Very often, particularly when I'm talking to larger enterprises, I hear, but I don't want my system to go live because some developer sitting in building five on the fourth floor checked in some code and all of a sudden it goes live. I don't want that. There is absolutely nothing in the continuous delivery book that says there is a problem with having a big red button and a big green button that somebody has to push before it goes live. It isn't that it has to go through without anybody touching it. It means it can go through without anybody touching it. So that you know every one of those steps happens in exactly the same way over and over again. Just because you can release after that lone developer over there checked in some code doesn't mean you have to. Continuous delivery is not just for companies like Facebook who want to release continually. It's just as important in enterprises who decide I'm perfectly happy with releasing to production once a quarter or once a month or once a week. Choreography. This one is a little bit more uh, contentious. I'm dis distinguishing it from orchestration. Most of us who have worked with some level of, of integration system understand the phrase orchestration. Think about it from the perspective of the conductor of an orchestra. Every big, everybody in the orchestra is paying attention to the conductor and they're doing exactly what the conductor tells them to do. You have a single point of failure. If the conductor falls off the stage, eventually the orchestra stops because they don't know what to do. That's orchestration. Choreography is different. Choreography, think of a dance performance. The choreographer is not out there in the performance pointing to people and telling them what to do. Each one of the individual performers knows what the outcome is supposed to be, they understand what it is that they're individually trying to achieve, and they perform to that vision. And they respond when things change. So if somewhere along the way I'm supposed to leap and someone else catch me, and I'm getting ready to leap and the person falls off the stage, I probably don't want to leap. But I know that the purpose of me leaping, other than it hopefully looking graceful, is that now I'm over here. So I just move over here. And hopefully the guy gets back up from the stage and hasn't hurt himself. The point is, I'm responding to the errors that occur. I know what we're trying to achieve, and I have the autonomy, I have the authority and the understanding to know what do I have to do to best adapt to the situation I find myself in without the conductor telling me what to do. A system like this is far easier to change, but it comes at a cost because it introduces failure scenarios that simply cannot happen in orchestration. Because you have, or excuse me, in, uh, yes, in orchestration. When you have a conductor, he's not going to fire off the second process. He's not going to fire off the leap until the person is there ready to catch. And if the person isn't ready to catch, he says, hmm, I've got to figure out what to do now. You have a much more centralized style of error handling. It's much harder to write choreographed systems. But we're learning that we have to write more and more of these systems now anyway. This is essentially the problem of distributed computing. Once you're outside the bounds of a monolith, there are all kinds of errors that just can happen that don't happen if everything runs in the same process. So you've got new kinds of failure modes. Contract testing. Think about acceptance tests at the system interface level. This is where we're documenting the assumptions that we're making about each other. I'm, I know that I'm making a request of you. 
and I'm making certain assumptions about what you're going to do with that request. And I'm going to give you a test that documents my assumptions about your behavior. And you're going to do the same to me. And everybody who uses everybody else's systems is going to do the same thing. And then we're going to cheerfully ignore each other for as long as possible. We can maximize the amount of parallel work. Because unless you violate any of my assumptions, I don't need to care what you're doing. When you use this in conjunction with Postel's law, you can isolate as much as possible the changes that are happening, and you can minimize the amount of communication. Because I don't have to talk to you unless your test breaks. And then you and I have to come to an agreement, and that person over there that I'm also talking to, if his test didn't break, I don't have to talk to him, I just have to talk to you. And we'll sort out our, our differences, and then we'll go back to working completely independently and cheerfully ignoring each other. Just like continuous integration, just like all of these other things, these tests are a trigger for communication. A wonderful side effect. This is a great way to make explicit the things that many enterprise architects have in their heads. The best enterprise architects that I've met, particularly at large organizations, they know all of those things that just don't make sense but are reality about how systems work together. Oh no, you can't make that change. I know it looks blindingly obvious, but if you change that, you're going to break that system over there. That's what those enterprise architects know. Those are the kinds of things that you can start getting out of their head and into tests so that we understand what the behavior really is. So, this is a whirlwind tour of evolutionary architecture. But what happens if you're sitting with a legacy system? If you're sitting with a greenfield system, it's pretty clear. The first thing you do is to define what is going to constitute good. What are the ill at ease that are going to have the most impact on your system being successful? Maybe in an early iteration, it's getting in, into production as quickly as possible. Maybe it's you know it'll never be accepted in the market without the proper level of security. Don't know. Come up with your fitness function first, and then start to think about how you're going to evolve that system. But if you're dealing with a legacy system, you still have to start in the same place. You have to start by figuring out what is your fitness function. What are the things that are important? Then you want to delay your decisions as long as you can. And part of that might be, what parts of the system can you not delay thinking about? Don't try to think about where you think change is going to come from, but think about where you're most worried about change. And go after that first. Understand the various forms of technical debt that might exist in your system. Maybe there's a tool that if you figured out how to get it out of your architecture, things would go so much uh, more quickly in the end. Maybe it's that you haven't been keeping up on upgrades. Understand the impact of the different forms of technical debt that you actually have. If you really want to do reuse, implement evidence-based reuse. Don't try to figure out how people might want to use your system, spot when people are doing the same thing in different ways and say, ah, maybe I can come up with a, a library that I can give to the teams to allow them to do it. And critically, keep and maintain the testing safety net, because you don't want to do this if you don't have the right safety net in place. Obrigada. And we have about six minutes for questions. Six minutes? Alguém quer perguntar? Over here. Uh, hi. 
Uh, can you give a, uh, an example of uh, architecture fitness function? A what kind of fitness function or just any uh, kind? Uh, for an architecture, like in a microservices architecture. Um, so a couple have come to mind. Uh, you might have some kind of uh, code quality requirements. So you might put cyclomatic complexity into your build or you might have a layering. You, everybody can inherit from util, but nobody can inherit from web. And so you've got some architectural dependencies that you might want to put into a fitness function. But there are also performance requirements. Can I, in fact, support 100,000 simultaneous users? So there are lots of different kinds of fitness functions. There's a website called evolutionaryarchitecture.com that has some fitness function katas in it, which gives you some examples of different fitness functions. I'd like to know uh, what do you consider that it, it is adequate, ad, a, 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 an adequate form to document an, a software ar architecture in order to guarantee uh, its evolutionary capacity? How should I document my software architecture? Um, what kind of artifacts? Yes. yes. Um, we're a big fan of, of architectural decision records where um, the important thing is to lay out the rationale why a particular d decision was made. And very often there's a lot of context that goes into that. Um, and so architectural d decision records are a mechanism that we've used successfully to document sub some of those decisions. I don't think that in particular is, is much different in, in an evolutionary ar architecture. Hi, Rebecca. You said that we have to minimize the uh, technical debt mm -hmm. and delay some decisions. But technical debt, to minimize technical debt, debt, we need to take some decisions. Yes. And how can we handle? My strategy is threefold. First, look at your bug list. If there's a part of your system that is generating a lot of bugs in production, you probably want to focus on, on those flows because clearly people get it wrong when they try to change it. Also, look at the actual change log, whether in, in your source control, and see where things are changing. If something hasn't changed in five years, don't worry about it. The third, and maybe the most important, is I try to ask the support teams, when do you start to get nervous when you hear that they're changing something and some new functionality is going live? And whatever that area is, you want to go look at that. Because clearly, things go horribly wrong in unexpected ways when that part of the system gets changed. So those are the three places I look to prioritize technical debt. Temos tempo para mais uma pergunta. Alguém quer perguntar? Não? Okay. No more questions. Obrigada.